are continuing our studies in the book of Romans and we are coming to a new section in it. We finished that great eighth chapter last week and now we begin a new section really of the book of Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 which deal with a number of very significant majestic subjects. The real heart of it though is Israel. What about the Jew? How do we explain Jewish unbelief and what is the future of the Jew? That's what Paul deals with in this next section of the book of Romans. And what we're looking at this morning with verses 1 through 5 of chapter 9 is really the introduction to this portion of the book. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and bless our time of study in it. Let's pray. Some of the most tragic stories we hear hear are those of missed opportunities. Maybe it's an athlete who wasted his talent, or a student that wasted his education. Opportunity missed. But when it's personal, when it is a son or a daughter or a brother or sister, then it's heartbreaking. Some of the saddest words in all of the Bible are David's when his rebel son Absalom was killed and David, the warrior and king of Israel, broke down and wept uncontrollably and cried out, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. That was Paul weeping for Israel. I could wish that I myself were accursed for my brethren. That's how Romans 9 begins, with Paul expressing his great anguish over the Jewish people. What what a mood swing. From the joy of chapter 8 that ends with the triumphant declaration that nothing can separate us from the love of God to the statement, I have great sorrow in chapter 9. His people were lost. No nation in history had the privileges and the opportunity Israel had. Yet they were in unbelief. It broke Paul's heart. But this sudden shift in mood indicates an urgent problem. Jewish unbelief raised questions about Paul's gospel and God's promises. In chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said that the gospel is to the Jew first. So why didn't the Jews recognize their Messiah and believe the gospel? If it was for them and true, well, wouldn't they have received it? Wouldn't they have believed it? Well, Paul must have heard that objection many times. But if Paul is right about the gospel and the Jews are in unbelief and unsaved, What has happened to all the promises God made? Promises of a kingdom. Isn't Israel's failure God's failure? Has God's word failed? That is the question that Paul deals with in these chapters. And really the larger question in the issue of Jewish unbelief. Because if God's word failed for Israel, 
then perhaps it will fail for the church. If God cannot bring his ancient people into the salvation he promised them, how can Christians be sure that he will ultimately save them? So chapters 9 through 11 naturally follow chapters 1 through 8. They answer questions raised by Jewish unbelief about the validity of Paul's gospel and the reliability of God's word. His answer here is, his gospel is true and God's promises unfailing. Jews are being saved in the present, a remnant is being saved, and in the future all Israel will be saved by God's grace. Still, Israel's present condition is largely one of unbelief, and that weighed heavily on Paul's heart. And he begins chapter 9 expressing that with deep emotion. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. After all that Paul has said about the gospel and the wrong path the Jews had chosen of achieving righteousness by works and law keeping, it might seem to this point that Paul was against his people. But if anyone imagined anti-Semitism in Paul, they were wrong. He declares any such notions false and avowed his love of Israel and did so in Christ, meaning he must be telling the truth. It's like a person putting his hand on the Bible in a court of law and swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the truth is, Paul's heart broke for his people. So much so, he says in verse 3, that if he could, he would be accursed for them, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. That's what they were, his brethren. Paul never denied his Jewishness. They were brethren according to the flesh. They were not his spiritual brethren, only his natural, physical brethren. But Paul was a Jew, and he loved the Jews. He had a great burden for his people. And what makes that so poignant, so sad on the one hand and amazing on the other, is they had no love for him. He was beaten by the Jews with rods. He was scourged by them five times. He was driven out of their synagogues when he was arrested in the temple. They, they cried out for his blood. He was public enemy number one. They wanted Paul dead. And yet Paul said, I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for the sake of my brethren. Not just dead, but damned. That's what accursed means. It's the Greek word anathema. Paul meant that he would willingly take his people's place and be cast into hell for them if by doing so they would be saved. A statement is similar to one that Moses made after the incident of the golden calf in Exodus 32, when God threatened to annihilate the nation and from Moses make a new nation. And Moses, concerned for his people, concerned for chiefly the glory of God, interceded for his people and he asked God to blot him out of his book if that would cause God to forgive their sin. Moses was ready to perish in the place of his people to save their lives. But Paul was prepared to suffer perdition if it meant Israel's salvation. Now Paul, of course, could not do that any more than Moses could have taken away the people's sin by his death. There's only one sufficient substitute for sinners, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a child of God, Paul knew that he could not be separated from Christ. He's just taught that. He's just stated that in chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So Paul wasn't actually asking to be damned for their sakes. He was showing, though, his true heart for the Jews, saying, really, if it were possible to do that, then he would do that. James Denny called it a spark from the fire of Christ's substitutionary love. And that's the love that Paul had. It was a sacrificial love for the Jewish people. He loved them the way Christ loves. And because of that, because of his unconditional love, his deep love for his people, he set aside personal concerns, concerns about rejection and uh, about his physical safety and went into synagogues and preached Christ. That's love. Later in chapter 15, Paul says that we are to please our neighbor for his good and edification. We're to have it as our chief aim, the edification, the good, the building up of our neighbor and the things we do. Put our neighbor ahead of ourself. And that's what Paul did for the Jews. He took beatings to give them Christ. I think one beating would have been enough to keep me out of the synagogue, but not Paul. He was the chief of soul winners and he loved his kinsmen. What a contrast it is to much of what we read in church history. There are many dark passages in it and I won't ascribe it to genuine believers in the genuine church, but there are cases in which we have some sad chapters in church history that don't show a love for the Jewish people. Um, it's a stain on the church and it certainly doesn't reflect the heart of the apostle here. The heart of the apostle that we see here is to beat in the chest of each one of us. We are to have a love for the lost that is like this love that Paul has for his people. He had a great love for the Jew. His sorrow for them should be ours as well, not just for them, but for all who are lost. What made Paul's great grief for them even greater was the unique privileges that Israel had. No people was as honored and blessed as the Jews. There's a famous story about Benjamin Disraeli that illustrates their privileged place in history. Disraeli was Prime Minister of England during the reign of Queen Victoria, and he was a Jew. Disraeli, uh, in his younger days in Parliament, was uh, faced with opposition from different individuals. And one man, one of his opponents, made a disparaging reference to his Jewish ancestry. Disraeli answered, yes, sir, I am a Jew. And I remind my illustrious opponent that when the ancestors of that right honorable gentleman were brutal savages eating nuts in a German forest, my ancestors were serving as priests in the Temple of Solomon and were giving law and religion to the world. Well, that's an effective response, and it's a true one. The Jewish people have an ancient and illustrative history which was a source of Paul's anguish. They had great privilege. They had great opportunity. In spite of that, in spite of all of that, they had come short. Well, in verses 4 and 5, Paul lists the privileges that they had, not only listing them to give the reason for his great sorrow, but also to lay, lay the ground for his defense of God's word and God's faithfulness. As he will explain, God's promises to Israel had not failed. There is a future for Israel. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, he will say in chapter 11 and verse 2. And these privileges that he lists now indicate that. The name Israelites indicates that. It has uh, spiritual significance. It, it refers to the position that the, the members of the Jewish race have with God. It was the name, you'll remember, that God gave to Jacob 
when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord at the river Jabbok. It's recorded in Genesis 32, and they struggled through the night. And finally, Jacob prevailed. He would not let go of the angel, who he later recognizes as the Lord himself. And so, because he prevailed, God gave him a new name. He changed his name from Jacob, which means the usurper. It's not a flattering name. And gives him the name Israel. It's a name and a title of honor. And Paul says the Jews are Israelites. Present tense. They still are. Though in unbelief, God has not rejected them. They still have a special place in his program for history. Paul then lists eight privileges that the Israelites have. And first, he says they have been, they are called sons. They have the adoption as sons. And throughout the Old Testament, God refers to Israel as his son. He told Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. A privileged son is what he's saying. Paul says they are sons by adoption, not natural sons, but sons by grace, sons by God's choice. So the blessing of adoption means election. They are God's chosen people. They did not choose God, God chose them. They are sons by adoption. Now for Christians, adoption is an important word, very important word. And what it means is that we have been given all of the rights and the privileges of the sons of God that are included in the new covenant. All the blessings of God's family are ours. They are spiritual, eternal blessings, the blessings of the new covenant. For Israel, adoption gave the nation the rights and the privileges of the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. It didn't include eternal salvation. They were temporal blessings, but it does indicate God's continuing regard for them. Even though they are in unbelief and like branches broken off from the olive tree. That's the analogy that Paul will use in chapter 11 to explain what's happened to Israel. Nevertheless, they are, have been throughout history miraculously preserved. And they've been preserved for future blessing. Well, the second privilege that Israelites had and have is the glory which was the visible splendor of God's presence. They had that in their history. And it was a great blessing and a great statement from the Lord God. The glory that he's speaking of here is that which was manifested when God led Israel out of Egypt and guided them through the sea and the wilderness in the pillar of cloud and fire. He led them and protected them through the desert, into the promised land, into Canaan, which became theirs. Now, this is the glory that's called the Shekinah, that filled the tabernacle, and then under Solomon filled the temple, and came to reside within the Holy of Holies, between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. It was the visible sign that God was dwelling among them. He was dwelling with His people, and it was the sign and the symbol that he was for them. The third privilege is the covenants. Not just the old covenant, the covenant at, at Sinai, the conditional covenant, the covenant of the law. But the, this is all the covenants. This is the unconditional ones as well. Those unconditional covenants are the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant, which include the promises of land and the messianic kingdom and new hearts, faith and forgiveness, grace. Forgiveness is the promise that's given in Jeremiah 31 where the new covenant is revealed and God states that He will establish it with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, that's not yet happened. This whole issue here in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is dealing with the Jew. Why 
has that not happened? Why are they not saved and enjoying that great promise? Well, it, it's not happened. Gentiles have been brought into that covenant. But all of these promises are for Israel and they must be fulfilled because God has made that promise. And His Word stands. His Word cannot fail. So the promises of that, those covenants will take place. Well, next Paul mentions the giving of the law. The fact that, the fact that God entrusted Israel with His law shows what a privileged position they had. And uh, what a privilege that was. The, the law doesn't say, back in chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul made that clear, that uh, by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. But through the law men do learn their condition. They learn their need for the Savior. They learn that they have, they're sinful. They've fallen short. And they are in desperate condition. That is a great blessing. That is a great privilege to know what our need is. So Paul in, Roman, in Galatians chapter 3 speaks of this aspect of the law. It wasn't given to save. It was given to expose our need. He calls it a, a tutor. He calls it a schoolmaster. It was, it was to teach the nation. To teach them it, its, its need and also to show them uh, the solution. And that's what the next privilege and blessing did that Paul mentions, that of the temple service with the priesthood and the sacrifices of all the nations of the earth. Only Israel was chosen to be God's priests. It was given pure worship, the opposite of the, the vile, cruel religions of the Gentiles. Its sights and sounds were clean and beautiful it, with, with choruses and colors, but also sacrifices. At the heart of it all, at the, at the heart of Israel, the heart of the nation was the temple. And the heart of the temple was the altar, the sacrifice, the place of sacrifice. And there, these sacrifices were made daily, morning and evening day after day, week after week, month after month, and then there were the high holy days and the day of atonement and the Passover and all of this so that the people saw constantly the shedding of blood. And they were reminded, as the author of Hebrews puts it, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. What a great privilege to see that great truth daily, night and day. The majority of the people missed the truth, it's true, and saw their salvation in the offerings of the bulls and goats and in law keeping. But still, they were given the great privilege of divine revelation. At the end of verse 4, Paul mentions the promises which include all of the promises of the covenants that have already been mentioned. But in particular, this is different from that. This is a specific reference to the promises of the Messiah and the Redeemer who was foreshadowed in the offerings of the temple service. He, he was first promised the Savior, the Messiah, in Genesis chapter 3, and verse 15, where God told Adam and Eve that the seed of the woman would be a deliverer. He would uh, crush the head of the serpent who would crush his heel. It's a reference to some violence that would come but would end up in the defeat of Satan. And what it's referring to is the cross. And that becomes uh, clear as the, un the Old Testament unfolds and more revelation is given until we reach the height of it all, the height of revelation in the Old Testament in regard to Christ in Isaiah 53 and the great prophecy, the detailed prophecy of the suffering servant. The promise. These are the promises that were given. In verse 5 Paul lists the seventh privilege, that of the fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
and their example. Abraham's great example. We've seen that already in the book of Romans in chapter 4. He's the great example of faith. He wasn't justified by law keeping. There was no law when he was justified. It was through faith and the promise that God had made. And so they had that great example from him and from Isaac and from Jacob, same thing. But others as well. We can go beyond those patriarchs. A nation takes pride in its heroes and Israel had the greatest heroes, Moses, Joseph, Joshua, Samson, Samuel, David, many others. Men who killed wild beasts, defeated armies, slew giants. Great heroes. Men with flaws, it's true, but, but men whose lives taught lessons. Lessons of faith, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. And lessons about God's faithfulness. We certainly see God's faithfulness in regard to David, but in regard to all of them. And, and all of their lives, to one degree or another, in one way or another, were a reflection and a projection of the Messiah to come, the Savior to come. Samuel is the great prophet. And the one to come would be a prophet, as Moses was. And David is the great king. And there would be a king, the Messiah to come would be like that. So they had this rich history that, that was more than a, a rich history. It was an instructive history and heritage that told them the truth of God and the gospel. And it is from them, from this race, that the Messiah came, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh. That's the last privilege that Paul mentions, and that is the greatest privilege of all. John Calvin wrote, If he honored the whole human race when he connected himself with it by sharing our nature, much more did he honor the Jews with whom he desired to have a close bond. The fact that Paul qualifies Christ with the words according to the flesh indicates that uh, more can be said about him than that he, he was a man. He had a human nature and an earthly life. And in fact, Paul does say much more. He, he concludes the verse with a doxology that identifies Christ as God, who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. Now that's the New American Standard Bible, and that reflects, I think, a very accurate statement of the Greek text. But liberal theologians generally disagree with that and punctuate the verse differently. There are no punctuation marks in the Greek text originally. They've all been put there by uh, translators. And they, tra they translate this or uh, punctuate the, the text differently so that the, the doxology is not really ascribed to Christ but to the Father. So, for example, the Revised Standard Version is translated in that way. According to the flesh is the Christ. God who is over all be blessed forever. Amen. So, Christ and then the praise goes to God the Father. But the grammar does not support that, doesn't support identifying the, or separating this two, the two. The grammar of the text supports Christ as God because the words who is are most naturally taken with the previous statement joining Christ with God. The British scholar Charles Cranfield regarded it as, he said, virtually certain that Christ intended to describe, that Paul dis did, intended to describe Christ as God over all forever praised. That's the way we should understand this. And what that means is Paul is testifying here to the deity of Jesus Christ. He was not confusing the persons of the Godhead. He was not saying that Christ is God the Father. He's God the Son. He stated that at the very beginning of the book in chapter 1 and verse 4 where he says he was declared to be that through the resurrection. He's the second person of the Trinity who became man with a sinless but genuine human nature so that he is the God-man. Fully God, fully man, or as the ancient theologians put it, very God of very God. 
He came from God. He's eternally from God. He's eternally the Son. He must be for the gospel to be true. And the book of Romans is all about the gospel, which is, as Paul said back in the beginning in chapter 1, verse 16, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But there would be no power in the gospel, and faith would be empty if Jesus were not God. Now, that's an important statement I just made. The deity of Christ is essential to the gospel. And so I want to pause for a moment in our lesson because this is about the blessings that Israel was given, God's faithfulness to bless them, and how they failed. But this is one, this is the reason why this last blessing listed is so important. And so I want to spend a moment explaining why it is important that we understand this as the deity of Christ. Salvation, and that's what this book is about because it's about the gospel. Salvation is about the forgiveness and the removal of sin. But how can sin against the infinite God be forgiven? The guilt of it is infinite because it's against an infinite God. And so it, our guilt and our sin is greater than anything we're able to do to remove it. We'd have to spend all eternity working to remove it, which means we could never remove it. Now you think, well, God, God will just forgive these things. God will just, he's a big God. And we consider people big if, and tolerant if they just forgive things. But God cannot do that. God cannot simply overlook things as we might do that because God is holy absolutely holy, and he cannot violate his holiness and justice. He must deal with and correct injustice and sin and put everything right. He must punish sin if he's a holy God. Which leads to the great question that Job asked, how can a man be right with God? Who's going to put me right with God? I can't do it. If he deals with our sin and deals with it justly, then we will all perish because we're all guilty. What's a solution? Is there a solution? Well, God found the solution, and the solution is the God-man. We have, we have paid the price for our sin in the death of another man. We have paid the price through the payment that someone else made for us the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to be our substitute. And He was able to remove the infinite guilt of sin because His deity invested His human life and sacrifice with infinite value. Because Christ was a man, He could, he could stand for men. He could be a substitute. A bull, a goat, a lamb cannot be a substitute for a human being. It must be another man. It must be another human being. But because He is God, His death is effective in paying for all the sins of those for whom He died and an infinite number of sins if that were His choice. His death because of His deity is sufficient for all our sins. The Savior of the world, therefore, must be the God-man and He became that Savior by not simply the Incarnation and becoming a God-man, but sacrificing Himself on the cross, and in so doing, through His death, paying the penalty for sin, paying for our sins. And His death was successful because He triumphed over the grave and the resurrection. That's what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 4. And as a result of that, as Paul says here, He is over all. He is not only raised from the dead, but He is enthroned at the right hand of the Father, ruling over the universe. Well, this last privilege <clears throat> of Christ coming from Israel is, as I said, the greatest of all the privileges that Paul lists here. It was the fulfillment of prophecy. It was the fulfillment, for example, of Isaiah 7, verse 14, the promise of Emmanuel, which means God with us. And yet this privilege is 
the one the people did not accept. They accepted the law, they accepted the covenants, they accepted the glory, they accepted, they didn't accept this one. They never possessed him. They didn't accept him. So Paul doesn't say to whom belongs the Christ, as he says with all of the other blessings and privileges. He says, but he says instead, from whom is the Christ? And the difference suggests the reason for Israel's failure. As I said, they never possessed him. Christ came from them, but they never had a genuine relationship with him. Israel stumbled over the the L of Emmanuel, the God part. And so the most privileged nation on earth missed its opportunity. God visited it by becoming a Jew, becoming one of them, but they did not receive him and did not obtain salvation. All of these privileges were given for that purpose. They were given to lead Israel to Christ. That's what the law was. It was a tutor. It was a schoolmaster intended to bring Israel to him, but the nation didn't arrive. Why is that? Did God's plan and all of his effort and all of his goodness to them fail? Did his word fail? In verse 6, Paul will answer that by saying, no, it is not as though the word of God has failed. He then explains that God's plan of salvation is of grace. It is of sovereign grace and it operates according to election. Not all Israelites are elect. The promise that he gives and all of the promises are for the elect. And for them, the promises did not fail, cannot fail. Well, that's the divine side. And God revealed all of this. On the human side, Israel rejected God's revelation and sought salvation in a different way. Sought salvation by works, by keeping the law. It was Israel who was unfaithful, not God. But as Paul shows in chapter 11, God is not finished with the nation. He bound himself to that people unconditionally in the covenant that he made with Abraham in Genesis 15. They are still in his plan. In the future, there will be a great awakening among the Jews. They will repent. They will receive Christ, as Paul put it in chapter 11, verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved. There is a future for Israel and an earthly kingdom to come. God's word cannot fail. And his faithfulness to Israel is an important lesson for Christians to understand because as indicated earlier, if his promises could fail for Israel, then they could fail for the church. But God's word cannot fail. All his promises are certain. They are yes and amen. And God's great promise is the gospel. That's the great promise. And the promise of that is all who believe in Christ are forgiven and saved. And once they're saved, they can never be lost. Well, David could not die in Absalom's place. Paul could not be a substitute for Israel. But Christ could and he became that. He died for his people. He took hell in their place so that they will receive salvation. And at the moment of faith, the moment they trust in him, their sins are forgiven and they are made children and sons of God. That's Paul's gospel. And that gospel is true. There is, however, another lesson from Israel's failure. And that is... Great privilege is no guarantee of salvation. You must be born again. Hearing the Bible read and taught is a great privilege because when you hear the, the Bible read, you are hearing God's Word. And when we accurately teach it, what you're hearing are, are God, the explanation of God's words of life, the way of salvation. But if you don't believe it, you won't be saved. Observing the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are a privilege. 
that they are a great testimony and they, they give great instruction. They illustrate the new life that that God gives in Christ when, when a person comes up out of the water or they illustrate the need to constantly feed on Christ by faith when we take the, the bread and the wine. But they don't save. It is only through faith in Christ that we are saved. So the question we come to is, have you believed in Christ? Do you understand that you are a sinner, that you are unable to save yourself by your good deeds, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified, Paul said. You understand that? Then have you looked to Christ and trusted in Him for salvation? If not, this is your opportunity. What a tragedy to miss that opportunity. Don't do that. Trust in Christ. Believe and the one who died in the place of sinners, all who do are saved at that moment and forever. May God help you to do that. If you've not believed in Him, and you who have, rejoice in the salvation and the great sacrifice that He's given to you.